Good afternoon. My name is Wilco Lettery, for those who don't know me. I'm a professor of strategic management and also the vice dean of the School of Business and Economics. On behalf of the school and on behalf of Maastricht University, I want to welcome everybody to today's ceremony. A special welcome to Professor Francis. Candice Francis, and I also understand that today your son has arrived here. Welcome to you as well. And of course, all other family and friends joining us today. Professor Francis is appointed as Professor of Accounting at our school. Prior to this appointment, he was a professor at the University of Missouri and the University of Iowa. I'm happy he has accepted the Foundation for Auditing Research Chair. On behalf of the School of Economics, I can say we are very proud that you are now a member of our community, given your strong academic reputation in the field of accountancy. And I'm convinced that you will be and are an inspiration to many. Now I would like to ask you, Professor Francis, to come over here and deliver your inaugural lecture entitled Going Big, Going Small, Strategies for Researching Audit Quality. Thank you, Dr. I appreciate that introduction. Um, colleagues, thank you for coming. Friends, family. Um, it's been a long time coming. This has been postponed two years because of COVID, so um, I'm finally glad the day has arrived. Uh, I came to Maastricht a long time ago for the first time. Uh, where's Roger? Roger will remember it uh, well. Uh, you can ask him the details. Uh, but I first came in October of 2019. I guess you can figure out which one I am. <laughs> Uh, this is not the best picture, but I want to thank uh, Willem Buying for tracking it down. It's the only photo we could find of that first visit. Since then, Candace and I, my wife, has uh, we've visited Maastricht many times, and we've come to love the city very much. So when uh, Anne van Strelen and uh, Roger um, approached me about the FAR chair, we realized that this was really a special opportunity, uh, and uh, we were excited to do it. Uh, I only learned later about the tradition of the inaugural lecture, so <laughs> I kept thinking with COVID, maybe uh, they'll forget about it, but <laughs> Anne is a pit bull. <laughs> she would not let me forget about it. Well, Olaf too, I should say. Anyhow, this really gave me an opportunity to reflect on audit scholarship. Uh, I've been at it for a while, and uh, so my lecture kind of provides an overview of how I see the literature evolving in recent years. And in particular, it describes my own journey from what I call going big, asking basic questions about the audit market and audit quality, uh, to going smaller with a focus on uh, smaller units of analysis, offices, partners, engagement teams, as a way of furthering our understanding of auditing and audit quality. Let me begin with um, drawing a distinction between auditing and accounting. I mean. My accounting colleagues don't need this tutorial, but I think those of you who are not in this discipline, it might be useful. Um, they're often equated as one and the same, but they're quite different disciplines. Accounting, we can think of as a set of calculative practices. Its purpose is to measure economic activities of organizations. It's often called the language of business, but of course, it's really the language of all organizations, not just commercial businesses. It's a scorecard for keeping track of how we're doing and who we owe money to and who owes us money. Auditing, on the other hand, is a discipline of gathering evidence and judging whether the accounting system, the outputs of the accounting system, conform to some set of standards. Audits are terribly important because it allows these organizations to go to banks for loans. It establishes credibility about the companies. It lets companies list on stock exchanges. More generally, it provides accountability to external stakeholders. This, of course, requires that audits themselves are credible. And so audit research asks the question, what is it that drives the quality of an audit? This is really important to firms, to regulators who oversee accounting, uh, the uh, AFM in the Netherlands, and of course, uh, users of financial statements. No less than the World Bank and International Monetary Fund have weighed in on this, describing accounting and auditing practices as, I'm not getting this exact language, foundational pillars of the international financial system. They go on to say, 
they are essential to the financial market development in a country and to the economic growth and ultimately the prosperity of the country. Uh, for those of you who aren't accountants, I'm sure you perceive it as dull, uh, somewhat mundane, but I'm telling you, accounting practices are of bedrock importance to the well-being of an economy. I hope I persuaded you on that. What are accounting numbers? We can break it down into cash flow data. A lot of what accountants do is keeping track of money flowing in and out of the organization. I would say that's straightforward, that's not true, but for the purpose of today, we'll, it's relatively straightforward. Accountants make lots of decisions about how to classify those cash flows, but let's, let's say they're more straightforward than accruals, which are subjective estimates of events that haven't happened yet in many cases. Simplest example, a sale on credit, we accrue the revenue at the time of the sale, but the cash won't be collected for two months, three months, six months. So at the end of an accounting period, an adjustment then is made how much are we not going to collect? We call that a bad debt expense. Now, financial statements are there's simply many, many accruals in the financial statements. These are some of the more obvious ones. And this begs the question, of course, just how big are these accruals? They're big. These are three well-known companies. I've decomposed earnings into the cash flow component and the net accrual adjustments. The accruals are over 50% of cash flows. They're signed negative, which means they're all expenses, and, and that's consistent with these will all result in charges to the income statement. So they're big, they're important, they're a big part of uh, accounting. So accruals are an important element of accounting, and we use accruals because we believe, and there's research to support this, it produces better measures of operating performance and simple cash flow measures. But research also shows that when accruals become large, they introduce uncertainty, and again, there's research to support this. So the concern is that managers can use these accrual estimates um, opportunistically. When I teach uh, financial statement analysis, I tell my students, accruals I think of as dials. They're like dials you can turn to make earnings go up or down in order to meet certain benchmark targets. Within a reasonable range, this is okay. The problem is if you go out of that range, you may actually start distorting, misrepresenting, and even misleading um, users of the financial statements. So audits hopefully give us some assurance that these accrual estimations that have been done by the managers of the firm are reasonable, they're not unduly optimistic or aggressive. That's what we hope goes on. Um, this is a standard audit report. Uh, it's pretty generic language. Um, so generic that some people think it doesn't really say much. It certainly doesn't say anything about accruals and the importance they play in the financial reporting process. And for that reason, uh, regulators decided auditors needed to say more. And now auditors must report what are called key or critical audit risks. These are areas that are especially difficult for the auditor, higher than usual risk, and of course require more judgment. This is the top five in the US, UK, and Europe. What's interesting is, except for restructuring charges, which relate to merger and acquisition accounting issues, every one of these is squarely an accrual-related issue, revenue recognition issues. The credit sale is a simple example of a revenue recognition issue. And a whole series of asset valuation issues, current assets, fixed assets, intangible assets, um, and then, of course, um, impairments, fair market value, all asset valuation related, and then, of course, taxes, sometimes called the ultimate accrual. I'd like to turn now to talk a little bit about what do the standards say about audit quality. I think of the model as a binary quality model. It's either things are okay or not okay. So there's no audit failure if the auditor issues a clean report, like the one we just saw for Ng Bank, and that there's no problems with financials. There's a possible audit failure when there's a problem in the financials. This usually comes to light after the fact, but the audit report's clean. The good news is this doesn't happen often. The proven instance of bad audits, if you will, is less than 1%. Uh, this morning at a seminar, uh, uh, Jan mentioned that there's like 1,200 uh, audits by public interest entities and maybe one or two audit failures per year. That's even less than my 1% failure. Look, I know bad audits make the press and you think the sky is falling, but they don't happen that often. 
I know regulators sometimes in the reports will say auditors were deficient in some procedures, but that doesn't necessarily mean the audits themselves were failures. These cases where there's a possible failure, and I, I use the word possible because it's not obvious that it is a failure, it has to be judged on the merits of the case, but often these cases do involve aggressive use of accruals to mask problems the firm's having. If you're failing, you're going to use accruals to try to make you look better than you really are to try to work through the problems you're having. So, and in some cases, you're just outright covering up fraud. Why does the auditor fail? In some cases, they, they are negligent. They didn't collect enough evidence. They were unaware of the problem. In other cases, they were aware of the problem, but made a decision not to make a report of it. That's a judgment, uh, and sometimes they make the wrong judgment. We can also think of audit quality as a continuum. Uh, there is research that's looked at uh, the failures, what are the root cause of failures, and one of the, not the only, but one of the major causes of these failures is the aggressive use of accruals to mask problems. But most scholars actually are more interested in studying the 99% of audits that aren't failures with the idea that there's a range of quality. And here we draw on the financial accounting literature, which documents that there is a range of earnings quality, a series of metrics that have been used to do this. So again, this literature shows that accruals are a driver of quality and that accruals are often associated with what I call bad stuff. Uh, in the extreme, client failures, um, interventions by regulators against firms and auditors. I'd like to now go through um, a general framework that we can use to study audit quality. And the emphasis here is that we can learn something about the quality of audits at each level of the framework. And it's going to tie into a point I'll make in a moment, which is audit quality is not reducible to a single concept, a single measurement. So the input to audits, of course, are people and audit tests. Not a lot of work's been done there. So we need the help of the firms to do that. Though we are learning a little more about people now, and some of my work is doing that and the work of others in this room. The audit process is then the gathering and interpreting of evidence by partner-led teams. There is work in this area. It's from the judgment experimental uh, paradigm where you will conduct experiments in a laboratory setting, uh, often with students, junior auditors, to see how they respond to uh, information cues and the decisions they make with respect to audits. So there has been work there, but it's not much work has been done on the senior level uh, auditors because of the access of, of partner data. That's changing because FAR now is giving access to high level Auditors. These teams, of course, work in firms and will be affected by the culture of the firm. A lot of my work is in this area, but I've been limited to what I can know publicly, uh, the size of the firm, their clients, where they're located. We, until very recently, have not been able to go inside the black box of firms to see how culture might affect audits. And of course, the outcome of an audit is the statements that are audited, audit reports, regular reports by uh, AFM, for example, and where litigation is allowed, litigation can tell us something about the quality of an audit. On audit reports, most are the standard clean opinion that I illustrated uh, before with Eng Bank, but about 10%, at least in the US, maybe less here, are what we call going concern reports. This is where the auditor opines, the client is having trouble, we can't guarantee that they're going to survive beyond the next 12 months. Clients don't like these reports, and the research evidence is that a first-time going concern opinion does have informational value to investors, to users of financials. And then lastly, all of this takes place within an institutional setting. Institutions basically define what auditors are responsible for. It establishes the regulatory oversight in a country and establishes the punishment for auditor negligence and misconduct. So the point is audits are not reducible to a single measure, that they're better when done by good people, applying rigorous tests and effective teams empowered by other organizations and working in regulatory environments that encourage quality. You can laugh. <laughs> uh, what's the point here? Well, just as in George Orwell's satire of communism and animal farm where some animals are more equal than others, some of these elements I think are more equal than others. Specifically, I believe that institutions are the most important driver of audit quality around the world. If you could, as a thought experiment, if you could look at every audit around the world, 
and do a, a regression analysis, the single most descriptive explanatory variable would be the regulatory regime in a country that encourages auditors to do good work. So I do view the audit factors as a second order effect. But among those audit factors, I used to think, caveat, that firms were the most important, that differences between firms were a big driver of, of audit quality differences. Coming down the inverted pyramid, differences between offices might be important, but less important. And finally, at the bottom of the pyramid, I used to think that differences in partner-led engagement teams were not particularly important uh, in affecting audits. So the spoiler alert is, I, I'm wrong. And I'll come back to this at the end of the lecture. So I posit that institutions are important. It follows that research is important into these institutions. And there are two designs for doing this. One is to do cross-country analyses where we see how differences in institutions across countries affect the quality of audited earnings. The other is to look at a change within a country, see how that affects audits before and after. I'll give you now an example of each. In this study, um, I looked at measures of investor protection in 42 countries, uh, looked at the earnings quality of listed clients, companies in those countries, and I tested the following investor protection measures. Um, this, a lot of this work draws on the uh, financial economics literature and um, that was uh, really started looking at cross-country work in the late uh, 90s. Legal regime, uh, basically what's the foundation of the law in your country and it's really a common law system following British common law or common uh, code law which is common in the European Union countries. Common law is different from code law in that it places, places primacy on individual property rights and the adjudication of those rights through the legal system, through the courts. Uh, code law tends to resolve disputes through administrative law. It doesn't go to the courts as easily as in the uh, code law, common law countries. Mm -hmm. Then we have uh, statutory legislation that establishes what the accounting must be. In the EU, we've got these directives that establish what accounting should look like and also auditing what it should look like. Uh, these securities laws also establish the uh, standards for suing the officers and directors of a company for misconduct and auditors. And of course, they establish the regulatory power of uh, the agencies that uh, enforce these laws. The other layer is corporate governance law, and this defines the role and responsibilities of boards of directors. In my study and other studies, the pecking order is pretty much the same across studies. Most important is the legal regime, uh, common law gives more protection to property rights, to investor protection, then securities law, then corporate governance. So the Netherlands is a code law country, and you're not going to change tomorrow and say, oh, wow, we should become a common law country. This is not going to happen. So if you are concerned with the quality of investor protection, you're going to play with securities law and corporate governance law. All right, let's turn to the paper itself. There was a body of research that began in the early 2000s that documented that earnings seem to be better in those countries that have stronger investor protection. Okay, what I showed is that this isn't necessarily true, isn't automatically the case. Uh, specifically, what we argue and show is that the effect is actually, it's mediated by the effect of these institutions on auditors and their incentives to do good audits. So we hypothesize the following to test this idea that as investor protection in a country becomes stronger, we predict that there will be a bigger effect on the quality of big four audits than non-big four audits. This is not pejorative to non-big four audit firms. I'll say that several times today. So the argument is, as investor protection regimes become stronger, bad audits are more likely to be detected and auditors punished for those audits. Bad audits are more costly to the big firms because they have a bigger client base, they have reputation capital, and research evidence shows that they lose clients, they have trouble gaining new clients. So the consequences of bad audits hit the big four firms harder, hence the incentive to do better quality audits. Uh, this is a visual representation of the results. Uh, as predicted, as investor protection becomes stronger, moving from left to right, yeah. um, the quality of audited earnings improves at a faster rate for, than for non-Big Four auditors. Two points to emphasize, this doesn't mean non-Big Four audits are bad, it simply means there are incentives for the Big Four to do better than average quality audits. And at the low end, notice that there's no difference. When institutions are weak, auditing um, is weak, generally. Okay, the other example uh, of a change within a country, I look at litigation reform in the US, 
in which the auditor liability was lessened under federal securities law. The consequence was to make bad audits less costly. We looked at two risk management strategies that auditors can use. The easiest way to manage your risk is to not audit risky clients. Sounds simple, right? The problem is you don't know that ex ante for a fact. And today's safe client could be a risky client tomorrow. So there may be limits to what you can do there. The other protective measure is to issue going concern opinions. Auditors will typically find themselves in trouble when clients fail. And so clients could proactively issue more going concern reports to give them protection. And again, there's, there's research that shows auditors are less likely to be sued if they've issued a going concern report in advance of a company failing. What we find is that after 1995, these strategies were relaxed. Clients became riskier and auditors issued fewer going concern opinions. The conclusion, and audit firms do not like to hear this, but litigation matters. It creates an incentive, a strong incentive to do good work. I'd like to turn now to some other lessons from archival work. Um, we'll start with going big. So this sort of extends the work of the earlier paper of the cross-country study. It's been documented in a number of countries that auditors, big four auditors do relatively higher quality work, including the Netherlands for PI audits, that's public interest entities. And these audits cost on the order of 30% or more. The big four auditors on average will be issuing more going concern opinions. These are the opinions that clients don't like to get. And a large body of research documenting that even after controlling for client characteristics, big four clients have systematically higher quality earnings. I think the auditor plays a hand in that through their uh, review of the client's financials. Now this kind of implies then that there's a market, there's a demand for differential quality. I mean, why would you pay more for an audit by a big four firm if you didn't think you were getting something? I, I know there's an argument that, uh, well, people are just buying image. It's a legitimate argument. But when you look at the economics of it, we can see that firms that have stronger need for a good auditor are more willing to hire the more expensive big four auditor. So I, the literature argues that the main reason for this is with an organization, there's going to be asymmetry between what the insiders know and what the outsiders know. The concern is outsiders like shareholders, banks, um, other external stakeholders fear that the firm will take advantage of the situation to fool um, the outsiders. And so, hence the demand for, I'm going to hire a really good auditor so you aren't worried about me taking advantage of you. So I look at these arguments and I document in a paper that firms that have high levels of accruals, this is what creates the uncertainty in financial statements, they are more likely to have big four audits and the consequence is that they have higher quality audited earnings. This research then has evolved to move beyond the big small firm dichotomy and the questions began to be asked, might there be differences within this dominant group of large audit firms? And the focus was on their industry expertise. Beginning in the early 1990s, the audit profession was deregulated and they began to compete aggressively for clients and they marketed their industry expertise as one of these ways of differentiating themselves from one another. In a series of studies in a number of countries, I've documented that the industry leaders, big four industry leaders, um, have higher audit fees, 20% or more, and on average, they do higher quality audits. The next level then, going smaller, the theme of the, of the lecture, audit markets might be better thought of as city-specific markets. I was teaching undergraduate auditing and we were on the audit report section and uh, I'm kind of embarrassed to say this, but uh, I noticed something I'd not paid attention to before. I noticed that the audit report actually lists, and this was back in the day when audit reports were filed on paper, and uh, the letterhead, remember what letterhead is? Uh, letterhead on the audit report actually listed the engagement office issuing the audit report. Well, that information is still on the audit report, but it's, it's electronic now. Anyhow. The, the point was, it's like, wow, I could put together portfolios of clients by office. But to do that, of course, I have to get the data. Now, this is pre-audit analytics for the uh, accounting scholars in the room. So I spent hours in the law library downloading audit reports on the LexisNexis legal system. 
And I put the results together in this paper. And what was really striking is it found, it documented that a firm may be the national leader in an industry, say financial services, pick any one of the big four. Uh, and it probably is driven by one or two cities. In the financial services, probably New York City. But just because you're the big dog in New York City doesn't mean you're the top auditor in Chicago or San Francisco or even Charlotte, which is a financial services center. And this begs the question then, so what's going on here? Is it the national expertise of the audit firm or is it office specific? So in a series of papers, I did horse race tests. Which one dominates? In studies in Australia, uh, US and uh, Great Britain, the results are consistent. The office specific expertise is what dominates and drives what we attributed as big four industry expertise. Uh, for knowledge sharing purposes, there's a big implication here that in auditing, it's difficult for firms to capture that deep expertise that auditors gain when they have a lot of work with a lot of clients in the same industry in an office. You can't somehow capture that electronically, distribute it to San Francisco, and let them have the same expertise. It's, um, it's, it's just, it's sticky, it resides with the individuals doing the audit. It's hard to capture what auditors know, what their expertise is. More generally, this led me to fundamentally rethink the nature of what an audit firm is, and I now think of them as not a monolithic corporation. When I teach auditing, I used to use the example of like a McDonald's corporation. Um, their, their crummy hamburgers are the same around the world. You know, they, it's constant quality. It doesn't matter where you are. Although I do think they're a little better in Australia. I think my family would agree with that. <laughs> so maybe it does affect by the quality of beef. But anyhow, they're a network of decentralized offices that operate with some degree of autonomy, although that's an issue right now. The firms, I think, are trying to rein in that autonomy. It's also the case, at least in the US, that they operate in rather narrow geographic markets. Around 80% of US listed firms, the auditor of that firm, the lead office, is in the same metropolitan area. So they're, they're kind of in the same neighborhood. So they're, uh, that's what I mean by a local audit market. Now, going even smaller, audit quality improves with the size of the engagement office. So let's just recap where we've been going. Big firm, small firm differentiation within auditor differentiation based on industry expertise, and then seeing that maybe that's driven by specific offices. Here I'm speculating that maybe what's really driving things is the absolute size of the office. And so I, I think of these as a, sort of related to complementary studies, and they, they make an important point. What we thought was the big four effect is actually driven by a small number of the very biggest offices of the firms. If you look at the data without those offices, the big four don't look like anybody else. Moreover, once you control for the size of the office, the industry expertise effects completely disappear. This means, I have to remember not to use the T word, Candace. <laughs> that means what we thought were the big four effects and the industry effects are not the T word, but dominated by the office size. So, of course, this begs the question that we don't have the answer to yet. What is it about big offices that makes them better? To do this, we are going to have to go inside that black box of firms because what we know publicly is pretty limited. These are some ideas that are floating around. A, a big firm has a bigger pool of labor to put teams together with. They can have more expertise that's germane to the client. And bigger offices will have more bargaining power, at least with their smaller clients. So when you're in negotiations with the client about the reasonableness of accrual estimations, um, you may have more clout. These are conjectures only. All right, going even smaller, it may be that audit partners are an important driver of the quality of audits. So we're kind of coming back to the spoiler alert here. And I have to make a kind of a public confession here. <laughs> I was wrong. I spent a long time, the last 20 years, uh, developing this like really great narrative of uh, Big firms, small firms, and then within big four differences, didn't think people mattered that much. You know, it's a typical kind of economist view, I think. All people are the same. Um, this study, uh, which I started a few years ago and it's just published, it really changed my mind. It l uses British data and it's, uh, oh, it's a fancy statistical analysis, but it does show that variation in partners explains more of the differences in audit outcomes than firms and offices combined. And 
That's the exact opposite of what I used to think. I think firm differences are important, but I really underestimated how important partner-led teams are in explaining differences in audit outcomes. Of course, just as with big offices, we don't really know yet why, what it is about these partner-led teams that matter. Why? <laughs> What's Marlo Brandon doing here? <laughs> okay, um, this paper I refer to as the Godfather study. Um, yeah, my Mossford colleagues may remember that uh, Pietro uh, uh, Bianchi workshop this here um, a year or so ago. Um, we were approached, well, my Bocconi University colleagues in Milan were approached by the government and given access to a government database of individuals with alleged connections to the mafia. And by the mafia, we mean the three groups in Italy, separate groups, uh, mafia in Sicily, of course, the Camorra in Naples, and the Undrangheta in Calabria. Uh, the government was particularly concerned that the Undrangheta was infiltrating legitimate businesses in uh, northern Italy, in the Lombardy and Piedmont regions. And so they were making this data available to researchers at Bocconi to uh, see what they could do with the data. All right, so on the left side, in the database, it tells us the people who have ties to the mafia. And then we can track that to accounting registers to see if any of these individuals are accountants. Now, we don't know what they're doing for the mafia, nor do we know which branch or group they're working for. But what we can do is we can then go over to the legal economy and we can see if any of those individual accountants actually work on what are called uh, board of statutory audits. Each small company in Italy must have a three-member board that does an audit for the company. So we can see if any of these boards have a mafia-connected member. And then we can compare the, their work to that of boards that have no known mafia ties. We also control for whether the boards of directors of these companies have any mafia ties. So we're trying to get a clean control sample of no known mafia connections. So what do we find? Well, you might expect, well, if you work for the mafia, you're corrupt, right? And therefore, if you work as a BSA, uh, an external monitor, you're going to be corrupt. You'll let the client do what they want. You'll have low quality monitoring. Well, surprisingly, we find the exact opposite. I don't have an explanation for that, except it does seem to answer the question that apparently the mafia can hire good accountants. Um, BSAs that have mafia-connected auditors have more going concern opinions. These are the opinions clients don't like. Their clients have better quality earnings, and they have fewer tax restatements, which means they're engaged in less aggressive accounting uh, tax practices. So, of course, it begs the question, why do these seemingly good accountants uh, work for the mafia? The simplest explanation is, is simply that the BSA work, it's transparent, it's visible, it's regulated. There are incentives to do good work. Whereas the mafia work is in the dark, it's in the shadows. So it's like I have a bifurcated personality. Over here, I do work for the mafia, but over here, I'm a good guy. I don't know. That's, I, can't, I couldn't be that way. Uh, of course, we know the mafia is deeply embedded in local culture and it, regions of Italy persuasive techniques. Now, I'm not kidding, you may literally get an offer you can't refuse. Regardless, we think we have clear implications for policing these criminal organizations. Yeah, you have to go after the organizations directly, but you've also go after the white collar professionals, the accountants, the auditors, investment advisors, lawyers, who aid and abet their criminal activities. I have to say it's one of the, one of the most enjoyable uh, projects I've been working on in recent years. I think we'll get it published, but that remains to be seen. Uh, this was another partner study that I really had a lot of fun with. It asked the question, does having a non-local engagement partner affect the quality of an audit? If you're a non-local partner, that means you're working at a distance, you probably don't know the client quite as well, and you probably don't have as close a contact with the field team that does the day-to-day -day work. Turns out this is common in the US. This has been driven by partner specializations combined with five-year rotation rules. 
What this means is a partner will literally rotate off his or her clients so they run out of clients in their home office and have to start working for other clients down the road. Or you might think it's down the road. We put this slide together. Yeah, there's some work down the road, like you might be in LA and you work on a client in San Diego, but look at the cross-country travel. It's enormous. Um, you're not just flying or driving down the road to the next office. The evidence we find is that indeed the audits are of lower quality. Um, we control for a lot of tests, as uh, Frank Morris put it uh, eloquently in a, a workshop yesterday, we beat the crap out of the data. <laughs> and um, what we find interesting though is that adverse effect is mitigated if there's a direct flight to the client. And there's some work in economics that has documented this effect as well. Um, the idea for this test came from an audit partner in St. Louis. I was describing the study to him and he was cringing, but he said, yeah, I could sort of buy your story. Uh, but I have a client in Tampa. It's a direct flight. I hop on a plane. I'm there almost as easy as some of my outer suburban St. Louis clients. Turns out he was right. Now, the moral of that story to my colleagues is talk to practitioners. They're great sounding boards, and they will give you ideas for research projects. Uh, in fact, the idea for this project came from dinner. Uh, I don't know, do you remember, Candace, 12 years ago with the KPG, KM, KPMG partner? He, yeah, well, that's okay, it's been a few years ago. He said, and I quote, I did not expect to be traveling this much at this stage of my career. Well, I put the idea in my back of my head because we didn't have the partner data yet, but when the partner data became available, I started working with my doctoral students, and this is the paper that resulted from that. Okay, I'd like to now turn to, um, I'd like to talk about one of my FAR chair projects. Uh, and I'll talk about the first one, what makes audit partners and their engagement teams successful. Of course, that was the title of the project. It's, it's grown in scope since then. What we're trying to do in this study is see if personality traits might be one of the factors that drives differences in partner-led engagement teams and the outcomes of these teams. There is a, there's a large literature in the organizational behavior that personality traits do affect job performance. And so we're testing that in this study to see if job performance is assessed as related to tra traits. And it can work two ways. It can have a direct effect. Um, let's take conscientiousness. This is one of the characteristics we study. You would think people who are really conscientious would be good auditors and that they will do better at their job. That could be a direct relationship. But it also could flow through their effect on job skill development. If you're conscientious, you may develop better technical skills, which in turn could affect job performance. So it could be either a direct or indirect effect. We have a big sample of Dutch audit partners and managers from the 10 largest firms um, the, that support the foundation. Uh, we use what's called the standard Big Five model of personality characteristics. Uh, in the interest of time, I won't go into the detail of those. Uh, we supplement that with something called the dark triad, cute name. Um, this is the idea idea of looking for extreme dysfunctional behaviors. Do people have a tendency to do that? And then another metric, uh, all these are based on standard instruments that have been validated in the literature. Something called bravery or courage, which is our auditors willing to stand up, which is really important in dealing with your client because you have to take positions, negotiate. Sometimes you have to just almost fight with them if you're doing your job well. And then we have a self-assessment by the auditors of their job skills, technical leadership, and commercial. Uh, these are skills that the firms have self-identified as important dimensions of the auditor's job. Okay, what do we find? Each of the job skills, as predicted, does affect job performance. But what we find interesting is that every one of the personality traits affects one or more of the job skills. And sometimes in conflicting ways. Um, it might have a positive effect on one job skill, a negative effect on the other job skill. So it's an interesting result that we're still... Uh, trying to unravel, aren't we, Lena? <laughs> um, but three of them have a direct effect on the job performance, extroversion, agreeableness, and dark triad. A quick comment on agreeableness. Why is it negatively related? People who have a strong need for agreeableness don't like conflict. They want to get along with people. And this is a great quality to have in a friend but it might not be a good quality to have an auditor where you need to be a little more tenacious, you need to be skeptical, you sometimes have to confront the auditor, and people who have a strong need to be agreeable simply may not have the gumption to do that. So it's not surprising to me in the data this comes out uh, negatively. Okay, so what we think we've shown is that 
Personality does seem to matter. It does seem to have some influence on the behavior and the performance of, of um, the top uh, leadership of audit teams. Firms might use this information for hiring decisions. Um, you might try to screen out people who are overly agreeable. You might try to screen people out who have tendencies towards dysfunctional behaviors. And then more generally, you might have more targeted job training. You might have sessions where you talk about why certain personality traits might be helpful and others might be harmful to doing a good quality audit. So you might be able to sort of manage these uh, uh, personality differences. And that, of course, raises, an, uh, I think, an interesting result. This is descriptive of what is. It doesn't tell us what should be. Uh, in fact, extroversion is the single biggest trait in importance. I can't help but wonder if it's over-rewarded. Is there a bias in the job performance appraisal system? You know, think of your friends. Aren't we all attracted to people who are extroverted? You know, they're bubbly and you tend to probably overassess how smart they are and uh, how competent they are. I think this could happen in performance appraisal systems. And then more generally, maybe personality diversity is something the firm should have at the senior levels of the firm. I know we think of diversity as ethnicity, gender, personality could be another one. Something we find in the data that's really interesting is you go from a junior manager to a senior manager to a partner, guess what happens? The personalities, they start to narrow. So there's a, it's like there's a profile to be a partner. I just pose the question, is that good for audit firms? It's something to think about. So I've described an evolution of going big and going ever smaller in focus, but I want to emphasize we still need research that goes big. And here are two, two questions I would like to have the answer to. At the firm level, what's the optimal structure for the offices? The two models would be a, a consulting model where we have a big office and people travel to clients all the time, or do we have what's been the traditional accounting firm model where we have lots of smaller offices that are a little closer to the clients? So we're trading off the benefits of proximity versus the benefits of deeper expertise in big offices, deeper labor pools. I don't know the answer, and this would be a very hard, hard topic to research. Then at the institutional level, of course, the big question is, what's the optimal level of regulation? I, I do have some opinions on this. I'm not sure regulation can improve audit quality much more than it is. I know the regulators find flaws in audits and the regulator reports you know, flag these and parade them out in public, but proven audit failures are pretty darn low. I don't know how you can get much lower than the rate they are, which kind of begs the question, you know, maybe are audits in fact too expensive? I'm not anti-regulation, I'm, uh, I'm not a crazy Chicago economist, but, but um, I did do something I hadn't looked at before. I, I ranked uh, US firms into 10 deciles, 10% uh, of the smallest firms through the 10% of the highest firms. And then I looked at how big are fees to the sales of these companies. I'd never looked at this before. I just work with aggregated data and uh, never thought about it. Well, decile one, that's in red, uh, this would be firms that have sales of less than 60 million uh, US dollars from memory. Audit fees are a whopping 7% of sales. That's huge because the typical net profit margin is only 10 cents a profit per dollar of sales. So you, audits are almost as expensive as the profits of the firm itself. And you know, even at the second decile, fees are 1.5% of sales. And even at the third decile, it's almost a percent. Now, it falls off pretty fast after that. So they become pretty inexpensive once you get to the bigger firms. So this does make me wonder if audits are prohibitive for smaller firms and it might inhibit some from going public. So you might say, well, that's, that's the way the chips fall. No, I, I think it's more serious than that because we know from economists that small firms are drivers of economic growth. Small firms grow faster than big firms. Small firms have greater job creation than big firms. So if you want small firms to be the engine of growth in your economy, you've got to figure out ways to support them. So um, I don't know if there are any regulars in the room today, but I, I think a challenge would be to figure out some way to lessen the audit burden 
for the smallest firms in a way that lets them go cap public and raise the capital they need for growth, but doesn't make it prohibitively costly to do so. I'm almost thinking of a two-tier system of some kind uh, for auditing. It's certainly an idea I think the regulators should explore. Okay, now as Monty Python used to say, and now for something completely different, um, what's this got to do with anything? Um, I lived in Australia for much of the 1970s. Uh, at the time when the uh, Aboriginal dot style painting uh, first came to prominence. I love these paintings. Uh, they speak to me. They, to me, they have an innate beauty. But I also am attracted because they tell a very personal narrative about the relation of the artist to the land. And so each of these are representations of the land. I characterize them as up high in the picture of the left. This is going big and down low or going small in the picture of the right. I, I own the painting on the left. I wish I owned the painting on the right. The iconography in the painting, it depicts trails, it depicts watering holes, ceremonial sites. It tells a lot about the land and the relationship to the land. The picture on the right, it's called Bush Yam Dreaming by a, a very old now um, a woman artist, Emily Kame. I saw, Candace and I saw these paintings at a gallery in Canberra, and at the time we passed on them, didn't we? <laughs> it's like, I wonder why we did that. So this is titled Bush Yam Dreaming, and it's like looking at the ground from three or four feet above the ground. And the idea is it also tells us something about the land. Um, foraging for food is a big part of traditional Aboriginal life and bush yams are a staple of their diet. So two representations of the land, big, small, each tell us something different. That's the theme I've been trying to get across today with auditing. So we're, uh, we're coming close to the end now. Uh, what have we learned? Audits are not homogeneous. Audit standards would imply that if you follow the standards, comply with them, all audits would be the same. Turns out there are economic forces that make this not true. What are these economic forces? Going big, audit firms are not homogeneous across countries. We've documented that, but we need to dig in and find out which of the institutional details matter. What are the dials we can turn on institutions to improve the quality of audits in a way that's not cost prohibitive. Going a little smaller, we've also documented that audit firms and offices are not homogeneous within a country. Uh, this is the idea that the, these offices are they're somewhat decentralized, operate somewhat autonomously. What we don't know though is why? How is their internal culture and structure? Uh, how is it that makes this uh, possible? What drives quality, good or bad? And going even smaller, Partners are not homogeneous. What is it about partners that lead to differences? Okay, I was surprised by this finding at first, that audit partners are not homogeneous. Now, why should I have been surprised? I mean, I look at my siblings. Uh, we're all different from one another. Uh, I look at my colleagues. Uh, we're all different from one another. Why on earth did I ever think audit partners, just because they rise up through a system, would be the same? Of course they're different. They have different skills, uh, different perspectives, uh, different personal values. So of course they're going to be different, and firms can't control that through their um, culture, their internal control systems. They can't completely control it. So I guess, yeah, that's my mea culpa again. Why was I surprised by that? All right, so now you may say, well, that's not a very robust list. You know, is that all we've learned? Folks, a lot of work has gone in to develop these uh, scientific findings. It didn't just happen overnight. Uh, and research, as doctoral students know, is a slow process. Um, a paper, a single paper, can take five years from beginning to getting it published. The wheels of science move very slowly. And we need to be realistic about what science can tell us. It's not going to give us answers to problems in the short term. It's a long-term process. So I'm going to close with uh, quotations from two intellectual giants who said much the same thing over 2,000 years apart. So I am bold to say I think we know a lot more about the quality of audits today, what drives the quality of audits, a lot more today than we knew 10, 15 years ago. But to paraphrase Aristotle, boy, there's a lot more we need to know about institutions, about firms, about partners, about individuals and engagement teams. 
And from a self-serving point of view, this is great news, right? That means there's a lot of work for us to do, a lot to be learned about each of these, about institutions, about the firms, about partners. And I hope the foundation will continue to support research that goes both big and small and helps us understand what drives audit quality. Now, before I conclude, I, I do have some acknowledgments. Scandal says I should stop here, but no, I haven't. Yeah, yeah, that's us. We've adopted the uh, Maastricht lifestyle. There we are. <laughs> okay. So obviously, Candace, you've been a big influence on my life. I couldn't have accomplished this without you being there to support me. I mean, you didn't raise our son single-handedly, but um, sometimes you did when I was at conferences in a way. So thank you for supporting me and what I've done and what I've accomplished. And then, of course, my son's had to suffer the consequences of that work. So Nathan and uh, my son Adam, who's at home with his uh, one-year-old baby in San Francisco, Thanks for putting up with all the time that uh, I was gone and working long hours. I also want to thank Nathan for surprising me. I didn't know he was coming. He showed up Monday at lunchtime. And then he must be Dutch because you know what he did on Tuesday? He, on a Monday afternoon, jet lagged, he called a bike shop in Valkenburg, took the train over on um, a s Tuesday morning, rented a high-end uh, racing bike and did loop two of the Amstel Gold, uh, 120 kilometers. Jet lagged, I guess it's a good, cure for jet lag. And of course, I want to thank our Maastricht friends, Imelda Bressers and Lucas Pinkston. Um, I don't think you know how important our conversations at the early stages especially were in helping us get comfortable with really practical things like tell us about the healthcare system in the Netherlands and about living in Maastricht because, uh, well, you know Maastricht really well. So your friendship has been really important to us. Um, the Economist John Maynard Keynes said, quote, it's astonishing what foolish things one can think if they think too long alone, particularly in economics, unquote. That was in the preference to his uh, general theory of employment. Well, I've been lucky. I've not thought too long alone. I've been able to work with wonderful colleagues around the world and doctoral students. And uh, Lena, as I told you this morning, I always learn something from my doctoral students. So it's a two-way street. So I want to thank all of my collaborators, past and present. To my Maastricht colleagues, uh, Anne and Roger, thank you for tempting me to come uh, with, to take the far chair. And then uh, foundation representatives, uh, Jan Buens, uh, Willem Bayink, and um, who am I missing? Olaf, of course. <laughs> How could I forget Olaf, uh, my, my collaborator? Yeah, thank you for tempting me to come. You, you all made persuasive cases and we had a kind of a long back and forth that uh, wound up in me coming. Of course, I, I need to thank the foundation for supporting the chair in my research. I wouldn't be here without that. Um, I'd also like to thank my uh, former colleague from Iowa, Murray Berrick. He was in the management department while I was in the accounting department. We overlapped in the late 80s and early 90s. I knew I needed a world-class OB scholar, organizational behavior, given the focus of my FAR work. Uh, Murray is truly a world-class OB scholar. He's got, you think I have a lot of citations, Wayne. I think he's got 45 or 50,000. And uh, yeah, he's a big gun in the OB literature and particularly on things like personality. And I talked to Murray, would you be interested in joining me on this project? And this was even before I accepted the position. I'm trying to figure out if I do this, can I get the team together that would really make it uh, effective? And he was excited and said yes, even before I accepted the chair. So that was great. And then finally, uh, I, I must thank the Dutch firms, the senior leadership that I've met with over the last few years. Um, I think the Dutch have a reputation for being open, candid, maybe even in your face, I don't know. <laughs> but I, I was shocked actually how open uh, they were in talking about the internal operations of their firms. I was like, I, I was shocked, I was stunned, this wouldn't happen in the US. And talking at length about their audit quality initiatives and what was going well and what wasn't going well. It was really quite, quite amazing. And of course, the enthusiasm they showed and the support for my two FAR projects uh, would not have been possible without them. So I do thank the firms for their uh, essential support. And with that, I will say, it is said.
thank you very much for this uh, very interesting uh, lecture. Uh, as an undergraduate student, I must admit that indeed accounting was not my favorite subject <laughs> at, at university. But I learned today that indeed auditing uh, can be very uh, interesting. It is important and it can even be exciting. I mean, I was not expecting at all today to also have the mafia in, as a subject in, the, in, the, in this room. So thank you for this. Um, thanks for, for, for having accepted the chair. I think it will be a big impulse to, uh, to, to the work being done here in, uh, in, this, in this school. And I think it will inspire many of the young people and also the more senior people in the, in the school and probably beyond the borders of this, of this, of this institution. And I'm looking forward very much to um, yeah, the, the rest of the work that you will be doing here. I understand you, you have been around already for, for some time, but because of COVID, of course, uh, yeah, it had to be in a different way than expected. Okay, so we will now have the opportunity to, to go to the reception and uh, to congratulate Professor Francis. Um, the people on the first row and the professors, they will first have the opportunity to congratulate. And then the rest, of course, can do that. Um, there can be a row. It's not necessary to stand in the row then for those who will do uh, the congratulations later. Have a drink first, and uh, then you could do that as well. Having said this, I would like to close this academic ceremony now. I invite you all for this reception. Thank you very much. <laughs>